Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Justice Talks with the New York Women's Foundation. I'm Nina Rogers, pronoun she, her, and I'm your host. We want to thank you for your support on the launch of this series. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page by searching the New York Women's Foundation and check out our first episode featuring Yolo Akili of our grantee partner, Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, or B. The foundation is a platform for women, and we invest in women-led, community-based solutions that promote justice. I'm excited to welcome our next guests, Bianca Shaw and Jeanette Vega from our grantee partner, Rise Magazine. Founded in 2005 and led by parents impacted by the family policing system, RISE believes that parents have the answers for their families and communities. Their mission is to support parents' leadership to dismantle the current family policing system by eliminating cycles of harm, violence, and punishment, and creating communities that invest in families and offer collective care, healing, and support. Bianca and Jeanette, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having us, Nina. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Yes, yes. So without further ado, let's jump right into things. I think we want to get to know a little bit more about the both of you. So what led you to the advocacy work that you do today with RISE? I can kick us off. I've been at RISE for a really long time. Um, I have been a parent impacted myself personally, um, been traumatized by the system for three whole years when they removed my son from my care. And I think that's what got me into this work to begin with. Um, just being a parent who was impacted and understanding the hurt and the trauma that I went through. I wanted to make sure that I was an outlet and a support network for other parents who were going into the system so that they didn't feel alone and they had the support tools and the knowledge they needed to actually navigate the child welfare system. Um, and I think a lot of work at RISE kind of focuses on that, on really building um, the leadership and the power of parents who have been impacted by the child welfare system. Um, I came to RISE in 2018, so I still feel like a newbie to the organization in many ways. Um, but I came to RISE because I was drawn to their mission of amplifying the stories, the experiences, and the leadership of folks who have been directly impacted. Um, I am a social worker by training, um, and a lot of my work has been focused on working with folks who um, have survived many systems of oppression. My own experiences is all about survival systems of oppression, and also about shifting the narrative of who we are as people. Um, what I've recognized that in a lot of social service um, agencies and movement spaces is that um, people and who they are and what they have survived has been defined for them. And what I really re appreciated about RISE is that we were speaking truth to power um, and that we were using those stories to transform um, not just systems, but also communities and societies um, to really support people where they at um, and to support families in thriving. Sometimes when we think of criminal justice reform, um, I think the child welfare system is something that people don't automatically associate with that. So talk to us about some of the common misconceptions that people have about the family policing and child welfare system and how does the storytelling that you're generating through RISE challenge that? I think the misconception is that child welfare is there to protect and to save children. Um, and what we've seen is that the system often intervenes in families' lives because of issues of poverty, um, because families cannot provide a coat for their child, or they don't have adequate child care, or there's not enough food in the home. Um, issues that are caused by many years of oppression, um, many years of um, disproportionality in um, housing, in um, health care, in mental health care, all of the things that impact our communities um, that parents and families are surviving through, um, the child welfare comes in and once again punishes us um, for living under those conditions. Rather than targeting those conditions, rather than lifting folks out of poverty, um, parents are harmed. Um, and it's under the guise that um, parents are abusing their children, that they don't love their children, that that they don't want to care for their children. And what I have learned is that that's absolutely not true. And as Jeanette will say, um, is that you can't protect children unless you're really 
protecting and serving families if you're if you're there for parents um, and so the work of rise has always been to amplify those stories to say the child welfare system did not support me in fact it caused more harm by separating me from my child by taking away the thing that i love the most the people that i love the most um, you have caused more harm you stripped me of my identity as a mother oftentimes you stripped me of my identity as someone who's working who's keeping stability within my home um, you've mandated me to all of these programs and and I'm still and I'm still harmed. Whether or not I get my child back or not, we are still suffering. And that that trauma lasts um, not just in their lifetime, but it often um, is layered in lasted trauma that impacts generations of people who are impacted by the system. I would just add that I think the storytelling elevates the voice of parents who have been impacted to really have their power back and share those experiences publicly, because the reality is that no one even cares or no one ever hears a parent's perspectives of what it's like to have a child with fair case um because one thing we like to say at rise is that pro parents are not the problems is the conditions that we live in and how are we looking at conditions and not people to really make changes in new york city thinking about your your mission at rise and creating a safe space um, for families and parents impacted by the system what are you finding now are some of the primary challenges that parents and families are facing in new york specifically um, and what support is needed in this moment I think at RISE, we created a foundation where parents feel heard and valued and respected, where they've never really felt that before, especially being impacted by the system. I think the safety of just being able to be around people who you can connect with, who you can tell your story to and, and not be judged by it. Um, and I can say, like, I remember when I first started, a lot of it was really about not wanting to tell my story to strangers but being in the space where other people have that same similar pain. And, and it's crazy because we always say that pain connects us in a stronger way than we've ever thought would be possible. But that's what RISE does. Like we, we have all of this pain and trauma and stress hitting up and in be inside of us that when we get to be with each other and just share our perspectives, share our experiences, it does give us a relief. Um, it really helps people relieve the trauma and the triggers that they're going through. And it's really important for them to actually feel those things and go through those experiences in order to do this work. Because as a parent impacted, I can tell you like a lot of my work career is traumatizing because of the field I'm in, because of the experiences of an impacted parent. And if we don't create those safe spaces, parents are gonna still feel the same way the system made them feel, right? Which was powerless, unheard, unvalidated, unvalued. Um, and at Rise, I think that's the main thing we try to create, a space where we're just parents first, right? We're not mandated reporters at RISE. We make sure that people are heard. We try to support parents with where they are and what they need. Um, and we always try to make sure that they're, they feel safe within our environment and that it goes for even people who are not impacted that come to RISE space. We like to start with fun and laughter. We love to bring them some joy and some care um, so that people always wanna come back to us because of the environment that we provide. What parents often say is that people within our communities, within these social service agencies, within these networks that have been built um, that claim to be supportive, often punish us, right? Um, instead of giving us the resources and access and information that we need, um, they often call ACS in to be an intervention. I think the work that you're doing is uh, incredibly powerful um, in that sense. And I think that's part of the foundation's mission is supporting organizations in a more holistic way and recognizing that uh, the harms of the criminal justice system extend far beyond the walls of Rikers or any one um, prison or, or holding cell and that these are things that um, can be lasting for families and investing in their healing um, and joy, um, which is what you all are doing. Um, so I understand you all have a new report out. So tell us a little bit more about that and what actions do you want its findings to inspire? So excited to talk about the report. And so, as you mentioned, Nina, uh, RISE recently released a participatory action research report 
that's titled An Unavoidable System, The Harms of Family Policing and Parents' Visions for Investing in Community Care. And what we heard on, on uh, overwhelmingly in that report is that ACS is in fact an unavoidable system. That is really hard if you are a low income woman of color with children, especially young children in New York City, that at some point you will, you will be impacted by the system. Um, we were recently digging through some data and realized that about 40% of children, Black children in New York City will have an investigation be before they're 18 years old. And so that's a significant amount of children who will go through an investigation process. And parents will tell you that just the investigation and process alone is incredibly traumatizing to their families. Um, and the report also calls for um, an incremental end to the family policing system. And so many of our recommendations are about um, ending the state central registry, right? So parents at this point, um, once you have an investigation um, and that investigation has been indicated, um, parents were on that in that system for 21 years. Um, and what that means is that their access to employment, many times employment that's related to childcare, um, they, they did not have access to, right? It's very similar to being on parole it's very similar to being on any type of criminal legal registry where you lose access to services and supports, right? Um, and that is impacting women of color. We also, in the report, talked about mandated reporting um, and naming that a lot of times mandated reporters were also only trained to look for child abuse and neglect. They weren't trained to actually support parents when they identified that parents needed support. Um, and then we also call for reparations of the system too, um, naming that what families need is financial support. They also need the system to acknowledge the generational harm that it has caused on families. Um, and the calls to action in the report are one, for folks to begin to talk to parents directly, to understand how this system, like many other systems, have continued to harm communities of color um, for many, many, many years, for generations, um, to work to support the leadership capacity of parents to lead a movement to end the family policing system um, and to continue to fund community, local, grassroots organizations who are invested in family well-being. Yeah, I would add it. I think the most exciting thing for me about this report is that it's developed by parents who have been impacted and it's going to open up the parents platform in New York City where parents do understand like their voice matters what they want and what they need for their families and their communities is important and that RISE is going to support them in fighting for those things is the most exciting thing about that. Tell me a little bit more about what's next in your movement to dismantling the family policing system um, and how can organizations like us at the foundation partner um, in advancing this vision for change? I'm like a start us off. I, I think the one thing that community allies, stakeholders, partners, parents, especially in New York City can do is just like connect to rise and be part of our movement, right? If they really believe in the shifts and the conditions that need to be changed and addressed, um, that their voice is the most important thing to be amplified, right? It's not about what we want to do, but it's about what those parents and communities want us to do. Um, and I think it's also important that the funding comes this way, right? We definitely need a lot of funding in order to scale these programs out. Um, we spoke a lot about our PAR, Paris Platform Program, um, but we also have a peer and community care model program that we're kicking off this year, which is really about just bringing more Arise out in the community um, and bringing more to the communities, the support networks that we, we create at Rise, so that parents can really thrive and have the resources, the spaces that they need. Um, and I also think it's really important to start just pointing out that what we're going to be doing for the next few years is letting parents know that they don't have to hide their struggles anymore. It's okay to say that you need help and get the support that you need without the fear of having your children removed by the family policing system is the most important message that we want to bring out to New York City. I just want to echo all of that um, and, and emphasize the importance of, of funding. Um, 
you know, specifically for the work that we are doing right now around building out a parents platform, um, Rise is preparing to um, launch our first parent-led campaign in 2022 and um, supporting that through um, funding, um, through training and technical assistance is something that we think is really important. Um, what we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic was that it was community-based organizations that were showing up and showing out for communities. They were the ones providing new mutual aid, providing diapers, providing circles for support, um, giving access to information, showing up at people's doors. And we want to see that level of community support, um, funding continue to happen. Absolutely. What you're saying reminds me so much of what um, the foundation's president and CEO, uh, Ana Oliveira, would always say is that problems, problems and solutions live in the same place. And I think when we say that, what we mean is that as a foundation, we understand that the communities that are closest uh, to the harm that they're experiencing know best what they need um, and then the solutions to change the, the conditions that they're experiencing and that they're living in. So um, I think that is that's what we do at the foundations. I think what you said about investing in those community based local models and scaling them up um, for change is, is really key and what we're committed to doing here uh, as a foundation. Before we go, um, I want to close off with the question that we're we're asking all our guests here at Justice Talks. What is justice to you? I can go first. I think for me, what justice means is just fairness um, in everything that we get. Um, you know, it's I think it's unfair that Black and Brown and Latin families are the ones that are struggling and getting targeted by the child welfare system, um, but that other people who are more privileged. Um, do not get the same repercussions that we get when they reach out for help. So I think for me, it's just it's just seeing a world with the government, district officials, and people who are in positions to support actually lend out their voices and their power to really support the movement of parents elevating and parents leading the work. Um, and I think also just incorporating parents in all parts of the tables, right? Because like we said, if we're the ones that are having the problems, we're the ones closer to the solutions, it's important that our voices are implemented in a lot of spaces that they're not currently in. And that policies, again, are also reviewed by parents and community. And I think just the separation of parent and child, right? We're a family. And I think if people start to say family, more versus parent and children, they will stop separating us and they will see us as a unit and they would really understand what it means to support a family and not separate us. Um, for me, I always think about justice as if I already had everything that I needed, right? If my community already had everything that I needed, what would justice look like? And for me, that feels like a full, deep, uninterrupted breath. It just means being able to live and exist in my body um, for families, for children, for people in our communities to be able to live fully in our bodies without the stress, the trauma. Um, I think about like when I'm walking through my communities, how much that has an impact on the things that I am seeing around me. Um, when I'm like facing systems, the impact that that has on my body. When I like hear these statistics about who is being harmed and the generations of the harm that we have experienced and what that does to my body. And I think justice means um, moving beyond what people can do for us and really thinking about if we had everything that we needed and we deserved. Wonderful. Jeanette and Bianca, thank you so much for your time and for your thought leadership today. The foundation is proud to support organizations like yours, and we thank you so much for your expertise and all that you are doing to change the lives of women and families in New York City. Thank you so much for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Nina. And thank you, New York Women's Foundation, for the support and rise. Always, always. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Justice Talks. We'll be back soon for another episode you won't want to miss. Until then, there are plenty of ways for you to stay connected with all things about Justice Talks and the New York Women's Foundation. You can sign up for email updates at nywf.org slash sign up. You can also follow us on social media at Instagram and Twitter at nywomensfdn or search us on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn at the New York Women's Foundation. If you want to support the work of organizations like RISE, you can make a gift to the foundation by texting Justice Talks to 44321. 
I was your host, Nina Rogers, and we'll see you again next time.